time of the Chofetz Chaim, a little over a hundred years ago, was when they invented the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, right? So he said that in the modern era, we're going to see a proliferation of technology, breakthroughs in technology, in order to give people a graphic handle on spirituality. The fact that you can speak into a, speak into a receiver, a communicator, and somebody else can hear it. Right? That was in his time with the, with the simple telephone of the original telephone. Right? But he anticipated that that's going to be, he had sources for it, in the modern era. So then came the mobile phone and the cell phone and computers and faxes and emails right, in the modern era. It's in order to give a graphic, there's actually a verse in the Torah, Haskes Ushma, that to Haskes, some people say, means to listen. Others say it means to, the Sfona says it means to give a graphic tziuri to illustrate what you're saying. So the Rebbein Shalom is also the, the teacher par excellence. How many people said Birkas HaTorah here this morning? What's the proof from Birkas HaTorah that God is a teacher? Hamalame Torah la'amo Yisrael. He's a teacher. Because no matter how much any teacher tries to teach, it needs God's assistant for the teacher to teach and for the student to learn. So God is always the shadchan in the birth of an idea and the transformation of information. You guys in your college careers came across George Bernard Shaw, yeah. in literary circles, he's referred to affectionately as GBS. So he was the one who once said, he's quoted as having said, those who can do, those who can't teach. And we used to add to it, and those who can't teach, teach teachers. And those who can't teach teachers write textbooks. Right? But okay, that was George Bernard Shaw, affectionately <coughs> re referred to in many literary circles as GBS. But there was another GBS who differed with him. It was a machlokis, as we say, difference of opinion. There was another GBS, Lahavdil, was Grandma Bobby Schiller. Grandma Bobby Schiller had a picture in her home of her father, who was a Malamid, who taught in Minsk. And she used to point to him and say, imagine how many children went forth to build Jewish homes from his teaching. So the Torah Jew looks at teaching not as something does because one is not doing. It looks at teaching as doing. Teaching is doing, because it's giving the wherewithal for others to be able to fulfill mitzvahs and Torah. Okay, that's just by way of introduction that things are being recorded, and things were being recorded as far as we're concerned long before the video, the tape, but they're being recorded in the ultimate recorder in the sky. But now we have more visual, tangible, interactive technology in order to reinforce the realization that everything we say, think, do is in fact recorded. That's on a cosmic spiritual level. We've always believed that prior to Alexander Graham Bell and post-email, 
that this predated all of that. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about the relationship between, and by the way, please interrupt anytime you like. I, uh, Lee and her grew up with, uh, in our home we had, uh, our family, we had eight children, Lee and her a lot of grandchildren, so I'm very accustomed to being interrupted, so uh, I have no problem at any point, please feel comfortable to, I'd rather it be a discussion than just uh, a lecture, but uh, as you wish, feel free to ask. If it's something not relevant to the point that we're making, then maybe just save it for afterwards. But if it's related to, to the point, even uh, tangentially, then uh, please ask. Okay, so the, uh, this week's Pausha is uh, one of the early mitzvahs given to the Jewish people. It is the mitzvah of taking the, when I say this week's parsha, I mean the, what we're going to read on Shabbat. We have a tradition that the week sustains its energy spiritually and materially from Shabbat. That's the source of energy of the week. That's why Shabbat is not just a day of cessation, but of course of the spiritual energy of Shabbat, it empowers the rest of the week. It's a, it's a nuclear reactor that gives the energy for the rest of the week. So up till and including Tuesday, the week, the first days, first three days, get their energy from the past Shabbos, Beginning Wednesday, they get their energy from the coming Shabbos, which is on the way in some spiritual sense. It's the, already the rays of that energy are giving us a certain potency and power. Okay, so we're Thursday, and this coming week's parasha is Bo, and we have the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. Let's just say quickly in passing that Nachmanides points out that the reason that one of the prime reasons Jews bring sacrifices is that the animal is a, here as a resource and the, should be used in a positive way. When a man sins, he really is in a state of rebellion against his maker. Let's pause it for a moment. Let's assume, just assume for the sake of the discussion, that there is a God and God gave a Torah and God say behave this way and people behave in a different way. So that's an act of rebellion. Any kind of transgression is a mini act of rebellion. You don't have to go around carrying a flag and signs, right, that, uh, that say that uh, they're against this system. Just any not any breach in the fulfillment of the will of God would be a kind of rebellion. I saw a sign that, uh, where was it, this place in Missouri where they were having the riots? Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, so somebody photographed the sign. They sent me a photograph of the sign of uh, some of the locals that was uh, in rebellion, and he had a sign What's this country coming to if a mother can't send her son out to steal from a store and feel comfortable that he'll come home? <laughs> right, it's a bitter irony, but uh, unfortunately, there's truth on both sides. But every act, every transgression, transgression is a kind of mini-rebellion. So we have a lot of nuances, subtleties, that there's a time where because somebody was overwhelmed with a desire, a need to fulfill something, one of his appetites, that's why he transgressed. He didn't consciously mean for it to be a rebellion, but it's a kind of rebellion. So the Ramban says that the reason we bring sacrifices is it's a tool. It's a tool, one of the tools in the toolkit of the Jew that the Torah provided, that since it's a mammal, 
that is being sacrificed, there's a certain level of identification, almost empathy, that we have with the animal. So I should be sacrificed for having transgressed the will of my creator because I was created for a purpose and I'm denying that purpose if I'm in an act of rebellion. As it happens, God says, I'm going to let you off easy. I'm giving this very simplistic terms. It's a lot more complex. But this is the analogy that the Ramban gives about most sacrifices. The animal is there to be used. We even have a mystical kind of a concept that the animal itself wants to be utilized for spiritual purposes. And Eliyahu, when he's having the contest with the idolaters, and they have their sacrifice and he has his sacrifice, so the animal that's chosen for the sacrifice of the idolaters doesn't want to go, the Gemara says, because he doesn't want to be used for idolatry. Because he wants his physical, material existence to be used in a positive way. So he's appeased by being told that it can come out a sanctification of God's name if he'll do his bit in this complex kind of a scenario. First sacrifice that the Jews bring as a nation is the Paschal Lamb, the Korban Pesach. There's a language in the verse that says, pull it, collect it, and you come together as a group, as a team, a family, neighbors, they come together and they bring this sacrifice. There's a commentary to Meshach Chochma, that's Rabbi Meir Simcha Akayin. The Osameach wrote a commentary on Chumash. And uh, it's very, very brilliant, extraordinary work. Uh, he passed away a little under 100 years ago. Uh, people ask me, how do you attain to humility? Beginners that come into Osameach and they hear that it's a virtue to have humility. But I recommend two exercises. One, Lahavdil, is if you haven't read any of Joseph Conrad's works, the British author, read Joseph Conrad. And that brings about a lot of humility for any English-speaking person. Why? Because Joseph Conrad didn't know English until he was an adult. He was a Polish sailor and learned English as an adult. So when you read the brilliance of his prose, that gives you a certain humility having grown up with English and seeing how he mastered the language. That's step one. La Havdil, step two, is to learn Mesila Sisharim, the path of the just. But I'll just give you a quick handle, run with this, fellas, is humility does not mean if I'm the best tennis player in the world to deny that I'm the best tennis player in the world. It means to recognize, that's false humility, that's nonsense. What it means is to recognize that any ability I have is God-given. Even the ability to develop my abilities is also God-given because I need it every step of the way. That's what humility is all about. And to recognize that there are other players on the field that also have God-given resources. What about if someone... A little, I, your hand, your hand. Yeah, but that ability, that ability to develop it. Even if they, it seems they weren't born with it, they're just, uh, you were born with the constellation of abilities to make this happen. Happens later, that's all. There's certain fruits that uh, they, they, <coughs> they bloom later than others. Okay, yeah. Is it a dangerous aspect, if, I mean, to show humility, to know... To not, not deny that, like, if you're the best tennis player, to deny that you're, if you don't deny that you're the best tennis player, can't, can't that build the, your hubris, however? Yes, it can, but it shouldn't. If, you, if it's balanced by recognition 
that I didn't earn that privilege. God gave it to me. And even the ability, the later discipline, anybody that has a talent that is really mastered has to be disciplined and dedicated to it afterwards, almost obsessed with it. They, that is also a God-given ability. A lot of people with super talent that just don't care enough to develop the talent. That caring and the ability to apply the caring is also. Right? I remember early on at the seeing the uh, there were certain certain guys I played ball with. I remember as a kid, and we used to define that this guy's going to make it big. Actually, went on to play uh, uh, minor league baseball, and there was another guy that was more talented. But it was predicted that he's not going to make it. Why? Because he doesn't care enough. He's not passionate enough about what he's doing. Passion is a fascinating element to bring creativity to fruition. I don't know if you fellas heard me refer to a book. There's a book that was written by an American author 25 odd years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, the Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. You ever hear me refer to that? Let me just quickly tell you, it was a very interesting book. Alan Bloom was a professor at the University of Chicago, and he wrote a book which surprisingly sold, uh, sold a lot. Bloom's thesis, he was a Jew, but he was not a religious Jew, but he's bothered, and he says his colleagues are bothered by the following problem they see a lot of students and they don't find creativity in their students that once existed. Now, this is 30 years ago. Now, you can tell me since then it's either gotten better or worse. I don't know. Okay? I only meet the guys that come to Osamer, and obviously that's a select group. The, uh, 30 years ago he was bothered that there's a reduction, a diminution in creativity, and he claims his colleagues have made the same observation. And I'll tell you in quick, simple terms what his thesis is. He says, the United States is founded on the premise that everybody has a right to their ideas, opinions, and ideologies. Step one. Step two, there's a problem because some of these ideologies contradict each other. Step three, so they can't all be equally right, they must be all equally wrong. Step four, the only absolute becomes that there is no absolute. So it's absolutely true that there is no absolute. Once you reach that point, that it's absolutely true that there's no absolute, there's nothing worth getting excited about. You don't become passionate. And if you don't live through a period of being passionate and excited, inspired by an idea, there's no creativity. The engines of creativity, in order for the pistons to churn, they have to be lubricated with a certain amount of excitement, enthusiasm, that this is a possibility. My, in my mind, it reminds me of a, there was a British philosopher, Boardman. Usually the quote is misquoted, but uh, it was Boardman who said it. If you weren't a socialist when you were 20, you have no heart. If you remained a socialist when you were 40, you have no head. Right? That was Boardman that said that. But you have to live through a period of passion. If your starting point axiomatically is not caring, then potential doesn't come to realization. Okay, so now I'm coming back. So there's a sacrifice called the Paschal Lamb. Now, Rameh Simcha, in this coming week's Pausha, the Osamer, goes through the following discussion. Since man is a very complex blend of the physical and the spiritual, he has a need to translate from the spiritual to the physical to render an idea concrete. He has to give tangibility to it. He has to take from the world of the idea and give it <coughs> tangibility, an experiential dimension. 
Why? Because he's physical. He's made up of, he can entertain ideas that are not anchored, but he has then a sense of a need, an urgency to translate from the idea to make it tangible. I've heard a friend of mine, Rabbi Ak- um, Aaron Feldman, who's Rosh Shiva today in Baltimore, <coughs> many years ago, he shared with me an idea, I don't know whether it's his or he heard it, <coughs> that that is creativity. You can define that as creative. Take, taking something which is spiritual and giving it physical tangibility. That's what a painter does. That's what a sculptor does. That's what a composer does. And I would submit that's even what a good author, a talented author, surely a poet, because he's giving you a poet and a good prose writer, a prose writer of the caliber, let's say, of a Conrad, his test of his prose is when it's read out loud, will it be lyrical? Because this, there's something that has been called the sound on the page, that there's a need to give it an experiential, that makes it existentially part of this world. So there's a need that man has, because I'm created soul and body, and I have to translate from one realm into the other. The idolatry of the Egyptians was this sheep. How that's possible, why? Separate discussion. But let's go from that at the moment. So the Jews are asked, take this sheep and bring it as a sacrifice. So part of the message there is a human being does have a need to translate from the spiritual to the concrete. (coughs) The ultimate abuse of that is idolatry, is to say that the man-made object or the physical object, the material object, is in itself God. But that's wrong. That's a mistake, says the Torah. To reduce, that's reductionism to the ultimate. To reduce God to merely that physical. But I do have a need to take spiritual attitudes, ideas, and translate them to physicality. Explains it very simply. You know what God does? God gives you mitzvahs. You have tefillin, you have tzitzis. You have all kinds of mitzvahs that are experiential. And what we do is we analyze the mitzvahs. We take them, and they're like snowflakes. You catch them on a frozen slide. You take them into the base medrash. You put them under the microscope of the Talmudic perception, and you analyze them. This is the way to do it. That's the way to go about doing it. And then I expedite the act. So it goes from the flow of idea to clarification to the experiential. That's the creative act in its ideal form. There was a British philosopher a mathematician. He was a while at Harvard, I believe, also. Alfred North Whitehead. He used to talk about, uh, he had a delightful phrase, something he called the fallacy of misplaced concretion. You look at the table, say it's stable, solid. It's not true. On the microscopic level, there are molecules in motion, the electrons and protons of the individual cells but given its chemical makeup, they're locked in to where they are, so it creates the illusion of stability. But there's a lot of motion taking place on the microscopic level, even on, on the floor, anything, anything in the physical universe. So he called that the fallacy of misplaced concretion. I want to borrow that term and apply it similarly that Yes, God created us with this need to interact between the different realms of existence, the spiritual and the physical. But the answer isn't to go and create idolatry. That's the wrong answer. What is the answer? 
to have physical expressions of spiritual ideas, a kind of creativity. But how to do that? We work from a premise that God gave us a plan how to do it in a positive, healthy, and productive way. That's our premise, and that's what the giving of Torah was about. So when it says mishchu means to pull away ukhu and take this korban, this sacrifice, remember, this was the idolatry of the Egyptians. What we're saying is, according to Rabbi Simcha, take the same inclination, the same need that you felt to have something concrete, but now move it in a different direction. There's a crucial Torah idea that is being communicated to us, a lesson here, and it's a very seminal idea. It's an idea that has, that uh, seeds all kinds of other ideas in Torah. The idea is that if we're created with certain inclinations and needs, they do not go away. What you can do is you can sublimate them, redirect them. You can't ignore them, and you can't abolish them. It's a fascinating line from Rav Sadi 1,100 years ago. Rav Sadi said, just like God is the only one who can make something from nothing, also God is the only one who can make nothing from something. That's the problem with nuclear waste. We can recycle and rechannel and redirect, but we can't make anything go away. We can just, man is a manipulator. We can reform and redirect certain resources of the world, including the resources of our own personality. This is a crucial point of debate, of contention between the Jews and Lahavdil, other religions. Christianity, much of Eastern religion, says you can deny the physical and attain to a level of total spirituality. Not only that, it's a prerequisite to get to spirituality is to overcome the physical. The Jew says it's not realistic, it's going to lead to distortion and perversion. The only way to get there is to capture that energy and direct it in a positive way. What has later become sublimation, long before Freud used the term, the Talmud was onto it and the Torah talked about sublimation. And that every need in this essay, this short essay in this week's parasha, Rameh Simcha says, every need that a man has, there's a potentially positive expression for it within Torah. It's always going to be governed by three crucial variables. Time, place, and people. You have the right timing, the right place, and the right people, it becomes a mitzvah. A man who's going to tell his wife, let's have a platonic relationship so that we'll have no physical contact, he's sinning. Because part of the nature of man, psychologically and spiritually, is he needs to express his biology. But there's time, there's place, and there's people. It has their context. And those are, that configuration is either ideal, or it's neutral, or it's negative. So the ideal, you can't deny it. Not only that, it's not just that they'll burst out in a negative way. It's that you can't attain to spirituality without utilizing the physical. You can't skip, skip over that step. It's a necessary and crucial step. And that message is communicated in taking an animal who has no spirituality. He can be used as a resource for spirituality, but that animal can be used, if, even if it was an idolatry, we can redirect that same impetus, that same need in a positive fashion for, the, for its ultimate fulfillment. 
So, every need that a human being has, ego, a human being has a need to express himself. He also has a, the Rambam, and we find it in earlier in other sources as well. A human being is a gregarious creature. He needs society. He needs community. So, he says, very interestingly, that's why on the breastplate of the high priest of the Kohen Godel, it had the listing of the tribes of the Jewish people. So the, many of the mitzvahs that we have in Torah, the individual should orient his feelings for need of a society and wanting to contribute to a society and a community, direct them through the Jewish people. You can become a crazy soccer fan and riot and trample on people at a soccer game. That has happened because people took that need to be part of a community and misdirected it. You can take it in a negative way. Here in Israel, they had uh, some years ago, there was some kind of a rock concert. Uh, they were trying to, uh, as they frequently do, import Woodstock to, uh, to Israel. And there were riots. Some people were killed, young people were killed. That same emotion to be part of a community, to be part of an idea, to need reinforcement, it's, it's part of being human. But the Torah says that there's a positive way of expect, expressing it. Now, there's a, one, one important idea that I must remind you of or introduce you to if you haven't heard it yet. Our thesis is, our claim is, that the Torah preceded the creation of the world and that the Torah was a blueprint for creation. God used the Torah as an architect does a blueprint for creation. Why is that important? It's a crucial idea because it means if you have legislation that turned up later, you always have the problem, the question, is there a square peg round hole syndrome? Is this legislation really fit to our nature, who we are, what humanity is, etc., etc.? But if we're created in relation to the Torah, it's the other way around. That this balance of the ideal expression between spirit and material, between body and soul, is expressed in the Torah, because the Torah designed us the way we are and say, okay, now this is the way to go about doing it. Which includes the fact that there's a, there's a crucial variable, again, is that the world changes, the world is in flux, and therefore there had to be rabbis who were empowered to make whatever legislation is necessary at each point in time, but that's rabbinic legislation and it has its weight, not the same weight as Torah, but it, there's a mitzvah from the Torah to listen to the rabbis as well, which becomes a very complex discussion. Okay, so, Osamech, a couple of years ago, we had a Shabbaton in Lakewood. I don't know if any of you guys were there. And uh, one of the... Uh, Local families uh, had had a they have real estate development and they have a a party hall there and they gave us the party hall for a Malavamalka Saturday night bash right Torah style a lot of food some drink a lot of music okay single gender so. Somebody drove by, and they're not accustomed. You don't usually find people in the religious community making weddings, Moitzi Shabbos. No reason technically why not. There are technical reasons why the logistics become complicated. But halachically, it could be. Let's say technically, it is a problem. Halachically, it theoretically might be. So somebody drove by, 
And uh, I had stepped outside because uh, after a certain age, the volume of music becomes unbearable, right? And you guys are still at a point where it's bearable. So I had to step out to get some air and some quiet. So at one point when I stepped out, somebody drove by and he saw me standing outside. He says, is there a wedding going on? I said, yes. He said, who's getting married? I said, body and soul. If you look in Shulchan Aruch, you'll see that candles Friday night are there for domestic harmony. It contributes to domestic harmony. Why? Because the light creates a certain ambience of positive mood, number one, rather than sitting and eating in the dark. Two is that very practically, people knock things over and it begins to irritate and people lose their tempers. So it's there for shalom bias, domestic harmony. So there are commentaries that say this is much deeper than it seems on the surface, not just domestic harmony between husband and spouse. <coughs> it's domestic harmony between body and soul. A whole week they pull in different directions. The body says, indulge. The soul says, wait, monitor it, gauge it, try and focus it, <coughs> use it positively. So there's a kind of conflict. Shabbos, because of an extra dimension of spirituality, we are capable, we're empowered to more efficiently more efficiently translate the physical into spiritual categories. We can eat more, drink more, and it becomes spiritually, we're breaking it down to the microscopic level of the spiritual elements that make up that physicality, which is a term that's used Kabbalistically is that everything in the physical universe has spiritual potential and you have to redeem the sparks of spirituality in it. How do you do that? Well, there's a program called Halocha. Another way I like to go at it is to say that the language is how we communicate. somebody speaks in a non-grammatical fashion, he's risking being misunderstood. I used to tell a story of a guy who saved up enough money to go, and he was in the old east side, the garment center, and he saved up enough money to go down to his first vacation in Miami, and he comes down, checks in, and runs down very quickly to the pool. It's freezing cold up in New York where he left. And he's been thinking about getting into the warm water. And there's a big sign up in the pool, no swimming allowed. He's irate and angry. He jumps into the pool anyway. He says, heck with it. I spent too much time, money on this. I'm swimming anyway. The guard comes running over and says, can't you see the sign? He says, yeah, but that's not how I read it. He said, how did you read it? He said, no, swimming allowed. <laughs> Punctuation, gentlemen. It's crucial for learning Gemara, too. <laughs> there was, by the way, uh, just at the beginning of the 19th century in, uh, in New Hampshire, I believe it was, there was a fellow that wrote a book without any punctuation. His name was Dexter, and there was a lot of complaint about it. He published it on himself. Seems he was an interesting character, this guy. So then he published afterwards a sequel with a few pages of punctuation periods, commas, exclamation points, question marks. And he said, anybody that had any problems with the first book, you can take this and salt and pepper as you like. Just put in the punctuation wherever you like. Okay, it's a great introduction, lahavdil for Gemara. Why isn't the Gemara punctuated? It's a long discussion, another time. But it's because you have to become a partner in the reconstruction of it, and then you get involved.
that's la'asok b'divrei Torah, which you can make a case, la'havdil, poetry has that similarity as well. Now, you have to be a partner with the poet in reconstructing the poem, the reader. Okay, so we, halocha, I would submit, is the grammar for the language of behavior that the Jew sees as ideal. Think of behavior as language. Every time I am acting in a certain way, I'm making a statement about the relationship between my body and my soul. If I want to communicate coherently and efficiently, so if I use the grammar of halocha, then I have a better shot at communicating efficiently and getting the message across. I'll end with this. I don't know if some of you heard me tell a story about there was a Jew one day, hot day, blisteringly hot, humid day in New York. He wanders into the Italian Irish section of Brooklyn, Bushwick, and he needs a cold drink. This was 50 years ago, and uh, no air conditioning in the cars. He wanders in, sits down, and he asks for a cold beer. He's sitting at the end of the bar. And the two Irishmen, Irishmen and Italian, are having a contest at the other end of the bar. Who can take an orange and squeeze it and produce more juice in the glass? And they go through a couple of glasses and they're arguing who got more and they're measuring it. Finally, as they're drinking, they throw down, one of them throws down an orange to this little Jew sitting, right, he's about a third their size, frail guy, sitting at the other end of the bar. They throw down an orange and pass down a glass to him, slide down a glass, and they say, okay, Jew, let's see what you can do. <coughs> Jew says to them, give me the orange that you just squeezed. They say, what? Not this orange you just gave me. Give me the orange that you just finished squeezing. They throw him down the orange, the Irishman that was sitting closest. He takes the squeezed orange, re-squeezes it, and fills up an entire glass. And it goes over the top. And they're sitting there in awe. So how did you do that? So I'm a fundraiser for a yeshiva. <laughs> I learned how to squeeze the already squeezed. But I want to use this image for something else, fellas. There's the potential juice. Every orange, everything in the physical universe has spirituality. Our job, our challenge, is learn how to squeeze it in a way that we get the spirituality out of the physical experience. How do we do that? There's something called Shulchan Aruch that tells us how to do it.